Great. Welcome everybody to the Quantitative Life Sciences and Medicine Seminar Series this week. We are very happy to welcome Dr. Benjamin Habkans from Toronto. This week's seminar is sponsored by the McGill Initiative in Computational Medicine. Um, so Benjamin is a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Hospital at the moment, and you've got this lovely slide that he has prepared to help me introduce him. Uh, starting out with a PhD in, uh, in Brussels, Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, then, you, as you can see, having a baby clearly marked on the graph, a postdoctoral fellowship in uh, Boston at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute with John Quackenbush. And then he came to, and oh, then he had another baby. And then he came to uh, Montreal, uh, where he was at ERCM for a couple of years, where uh, I had the chance to meet him. Um, rather sadly, he then moved to Toronto, where he's, um, uh, where he was, uh, where he obtained a tier two Canada research chair in computational pharmacogenomics. And he's affiliated there with uh, lots of different groups. Of course, the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, um, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, the Medical Biophysics Unit. Um, he's, he was awarded a number of early career researcher awards. Um, and more recently has been working in all kinds of uh, interesting research projects in pharmacogenomics and radiomics and working with multimodal data of various kinds and machine learning. And we are really looking forward to hearing uh, his presentation today. So welcome. Thank you very much, Celia, for the kind words. Um, I hope I set the bar for the next speaker in terms of slides. <laughs> Oh, let okay. me just, I'm sorry, Benjamin, let me just jump in one more time. If you have questions during the talk, um, uh, Benjamin would be willing to take them during the talk. You can put them in the chat and I will read them to him and interrupt him. Or you can also, if you prefer, keep them for the, for the end. Yeah, yeah don't, don't hesitate to jump um, and, and interrupt me. I, I find those webinar or seminars via Zoom very, uh, very isolated uh, in a way, so uh, interrupt me. I try to monitor the hands, so if you if you raise your hand, I'll try to stop. So today I would like to, to discuss some of the work we do in terms of research reproducibility. As, as you may know, it's, it's kind of a hot topic nowadays. Uh, our research gets more and more complex, and, and therefore we have even more responsibility to be transparent and share uh, all details about what we do. So I'll try to introduce a little bit the topic and, and more importantly, try to uh, show you some of the technological platforms that exist to make it actually quite easy from a computational perspective to make your research reproducible. So what is, um, what is uh, reproducibility? So you have multiple definitions and I, I really um, encourage you to, to read that recent paper from Roger Peng and Stephanie Higgs, the two leaders especially in the biostatistical world from John Hopkins on reproducibility. And their definition is the following, and I, I, I try to use that consistently. Uh, replication is, is the fact that scientific claims can be confirmed by completely independent investigations, which means you may use different samples, different patient populations, different methods, but the claim itself, the discovery, uh, can be uh, confirmed that way. So it's, it's a very high bar. For, um, for reproducibility, if you wish, uh, for the, the scientific validity of your claim. So what I call and what they call reproducibility is the ability of independent investigator to recreate the results from the original samples, assays, data, or analysis technique. So it's a much lower bar. You're basically taking everything they've done, whether it's samples or data directly, and you redo exactly the same thing, same assays, same analysis, and you get, you can confirm the claim. And what I'm going to talk today is the computational reproducibility. We're lucky enough to work with deterministic machines. So it should be, we can control virtually all the variables. So we, it should be possible for us to achieve perfect uh, reproducibility one from the data to the actual results. 
obviously there are many things that could go wrong uh, in that process. I'll discuss them a little bit, but uh, conceptually we can achieve complete reproducibility from a computational perspective. So um, why does it matter? As I already touched upon, our data, our analysis pipeline become more and more complex and therefore a higher level of transparency is required to really be able to scrutinize a given publication, a given study. And because of this complexity, we tend to have many, many hyper, many parameters, hyper parameters, many different choices of methods or cutoffs or thresholds uh, within a given analysis. So it's, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to assess the robustness of claims when you have so many, so many parameters that could influence those, those results. And maybe more importantly, if you really want to maximize the reusability of your research, um, you should be able to share, you should share the code and the data so that people can do other research or build upon what you've done to do better research. And I think that's very important for funding agencies, for patients, for donors. Um, they really, they need to see that all the, all the money, all the resources we spend on the materials they provide or the funds they provide uh, will generate a high return on investment because those data could be used by multiple groups, not just yourself. So um, I'll, I'll try to present a very, very over kind of overly simplistic pipeline for typical AI or machine learning or, or, or even um, biostatistic uh, pipeline. So you usually start with your row. Let's say you want to build a model. That's kind of the topic of, of this pipeline. You want to build a model. So you start with row training data you do quality controls, you do the pre-processing. So you finally have your data that are being processed and, and amenable for a higher level analysis. Then you train your model. Let's say you want to do a predictive model, whether it's patient survival or treatment response, for instance. You train your model, then you, you get your final model. Uh, you only use the training data for, for doing so. You have a fully specified models, then you collect uh, or you have a, a completely independent uh, validation data set. Again, you do the quality control pre-processing. You use that, um, use the final model with, on that completely independent data set. Then you try to validate the model to see whether the performance that you kind of observed on the train set seems to generalize to a completely independent uh, data set. So nothing new here. What's interesting is if you look at the different components, uh, you have data um, at Four different levels. First, training versus validation, but also raw versus processed. And there are a lot of complexities that can uh, take place for the quality control and the pre-processing. And that's the part that's often overlooked. So sharing the raw data is not always sufficient. Sharing the process data is good, but then you may lose some, some interesting aspect of the data uh, by not releasing the raw data. So really those, those two uh, kind of version of the data are important to uh, share. In terms of code, obviously, quality control and pre-processing, that's one piece of code. How to train the model, uh, how to use the, the, the model uh, on your data, and the model itself, like the full specification of your models. Um, let's say you have to get it validated by, I don't know, the FDA, you're going to need to uh, fully specify your model. But more than that, those are extremely important components, obviously, of your study. But there is, some, there is a part that's often ignored, is the fact that you work on a given software environment, a given operating system, a given set of software libraries, specific versions. Um, even your CPU may have specific numerical precisions. Um, so all those aspects need to be kind of shared as well if you really want to ensure full computational reproducibility. And, and you'll see what are the technologies that can be done, that can be used to share the, the full software environment. And if you, if you share all those components, then in theory, your uh, computational research will be fully reproducible. So I'll go through all the different items. So sharing the raw and processed data. If the data are not sensitive and can be released publicly, which is often the case in critical studies uh, or many other fields, then you can either put large files on well-established repositories. So I come from 
the genomics uh, field. So we use, let's say, the European Genotype Phenotype Archive. You can use NCBI, Gene Expression Omnibus, for instance. If you have small files, a few gigabytes, then there are a plethora of different platforms that you can use. Uh, Zenodo, Harvard Dataverse, Dataverse Dryad, Figshare. And some of them will give you even a, a digital object identifier for the data you upload. So they ensure that those data will um, be maintained and, 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 and exist 10 years from now, but they're also gonna, going to give you a unique identifier you can refer to in your collaboration, in your papers. If you need to share data that are private or sensitive, uh, whether you work with a company and you have some sensitivities around IP, or you use or you analyze patient data, let's say patient health information, then obviously you have to be very careful. A lot of people use that as a, as a justification for not sharing data altogether, and I think that's plain wrong. There are mechanisms you can use to protect those data and only share the data with people that are either legally uh, obliged to uh, follow certain rules or just people you can trust in general. So if you're a scientist from an established institution, uh, for instance, uh, you could be trusted to some extent. So you can set up a data access committee and, you, and, and together with that data access committee, you assign a transparent process to review the request. Very often you have a DAC, you have a data access committee, but it takes forever for your request to be request to be processed or they just reject your request without giving you a justification. So I think it's very important to set the rules uh, for who can get access to the data and those rules should be properly justified. Um, once you've done that, then basically you just need to work with a repository that can forward the request uh, to, to access the data to your data access committee. So you can grant approval. Uh, EGA is doing that, dbGaP is doing that. There are many, many repositories that can do these kind of things. Um, and once you granted access to the data, if it's already in an established repository, your job is done. Um, you, is, you know, they, they are going to communicate with the users and they will access you know, encrypted data, be able to decrypt them, et cetera. If you have to take care of the transfer of the, da the data transfer yourself, <clears throat> try to set up a system that's convenient. Um, there was one data set where not only it took two years and a half to get all the legal agreements in place, but also they shipped me the data on a hard disk and they shipped that by mail. So it was a whole ordeal to really get those data in the server, get it decrypted. So really not, not ideal. Um, so I already touched on the different pieces of code. So pre-processing, quality controls, and that also include curation of the metadata. Uh, very often um, there might be typos in the gene names or patient names or clinical information, not so much the gene names, that's fairly standardized, but any, any clinical information will probably contain typos and errors. Uh, so that needs to be created. And hopefully the best way to do it is to actually script it. So if you made an error in the creation, you can always go back and, 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 and um, correct it. Um, the code to train the models, that's super important, especially in AI and machine learning. A lot of, a lot of complexities are hidden there. Uh, do you do your proper validation? How do you optimize your hyperparameters? Um, and then the code to actually validate the model. If, once you have the fully specified model, sometimes it's not trivial to actually, you know, uh, use the input uh, and, and get the prediction. So I think a piece of code that showcase how the model could be used with a new sample to generate predictions could be very useful for the community. And so sharing code is probably the easiest part of, of all. This is usually super lightweight. Even if you have 10,000 lines of code, this is a few kilobytes, a few hundreds of kilobytes. So that's nothing nowadays. Uh, you have tons of versioning system you could use. GitHub, Bitbucket are, are two examples. Even if you, even if you use very complex uh, analysis, such as deep learning, there exist frameworks to kind of streamline the, the, the implementation of your neural network. You could use PyTorch and TensorFlow. You can even go a, a, at a higher level using Keras and PyTorch Lightning to try to structure the code in a very standardized way. And that makes it much, much easier for other people to understand what, what you've done and, and reproduce it. So better organization of the code. Obviously, documentation is a must. Reading somebody else's code is always a bit of a challenge. So documentation is, is not only helpful for you, your future yourself, 
uh, when you're going to have to revise your paper, but also very useful for the community. And then you should really think about your license. You can go full open source. There are some very uh, permissive licenses like Apache 2, or there are much more restrictive ones like GPLv3. You can even go with a non-commercial license, meaning that if you plan to commercialize your tool, you may actually give it for free to the scientific community, but uh, prevent companies or, or um, uh, prevent companies from using your code. So there are a, a very a lot of different options that allow you to be transparent as a scientist, but still protect your potential commercial interest. So it's a bit of, of, of a myth that either you have to go open source or you have to either you you have to be transparent or you have to commercialize it. You can actually do both. Um, sharing the predictive models themselves. So even if you have the, the data and the code for training, sometimes it takes, I don't know, a month of computation on a fancy GPU to actually get the trained models that you publish in your paper. So do a, do a favor to the community, just share this fully specified model is gonna save a lot of time for people who just want to apply the model and test it in, in different data sets. And even so, some models might be very, very complex, like millions of parameters, complex architecture. Uh, there are platforms to actually share that kind of information, especially for neural networks. Model Hub, Model Deep, and Model Zoom are actually uh, examples of that. And as I said, an example of code to go a long way to showcase how the final models could be used on, on new data. So I think you know, a lot, of, a lot of, of problems usually arise on how to format the input data to, to be able to run the code without errors. And I think a code, an example, uh, a kind of a tutorial on that uh, would, would definitely help the community. And super importantly, you also have to properly document the limitations of the model. Maybe it has been tested where it only works for a certain kind of, of data or a certain subset of the patient population. So you really have to educate the scientific community on what's the proper use of the model. If they want to explore other use of the model, that's, that's a fair game. But you can only, you only, you, you basically, what, what you publish in your paper is usually a limited application of the model. And that should be. Uh, properly documented as well. And interestingly, especially for complex models, some, some models may actually reveal, reveal some key aspects of your data set. So there have, been, uh, there have been cases where people could reverse engineer the presence of a patient that has an unusual kind of outlier statistics in a, in a given feature just based on the model predictions. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. Um, but the different differential privacy, which means that the model, you can basically guarantee that the model does not reveal uh, uh, patient identity uh, from, from uh, the training set can sometimes be ensured. And very often with very simple techniques, you can make, you can make it extremely difficult to reverse engineer uh, so some patient identity uh, from the model. So again, it's not really a big issue if you pay a little bit of attention to it. And even if that's the case, even if you're really worried that the model may reveal some key aspects of your data set that is considered uh, sensitive information, then again, you can share the model only behind a data access committee. It's very unlikely that the model will be less, uh, more, will contain more sensitive data than the, the raw data themselves. Uh, that's impossible. So if you can share the raw data with the data access committee, there is no reason that you cannot share your model via a data, data access committee. And that's not really something I've seen so far, but um, it makes sense to me. I'm happy to discuss that after the talk, if you wish. Um, as I said, sharing only the data and the code is usually not sufficient to reproduce the results of the study. You also have to consider the software environment, operating systems, software libraries, even sometimes the type of hardware uh, matters. So the answer to this, go virtual. And by that, I mean use virtual machines or, or, or Docker containers. And to, when you build those Docker containers, you basically specify all the required libraries and their versions. Uh, and once the container is built, you can add your data, you can add your code, you run it, you make sure that the results make sense, and you're done. Um, you can then ship this container to somebody else, and it will work exactly the same way it worked in your platform. This kind of virtual, virtualization is very important to make sure that 
you can easily deploy and reproduce results in, in multiple platforms. So this technology is really, it really a paradigm shift uh, in, in the field. And I think more and more people embrace that and build token container with their paper or their new approach so that people can easily scrutinize. It's funny because 20 years ago when I did my uh, studies in computer science, we, we basically studied hyper hypervisors, how to virtualize the hardware. And this is just a very fancy version of this. So I, I feel like we, we went full loop. Um, and the beauty, if you do so, the beauty, it becomes, the beauty of it, it becomes very trivial for somebody to reproduce your results because it's by construction is going to work. But it's also very easy to scrutinize and challenge them. They can just change one bit, one, no, not one bit, one parameter, let's say, or one method there and rerun it because they know the code, the code run already. So it makes it very, very easy to modify. And there are many platforms that exist to, to build such kind of containers and share them in the cloud. Uh, one of my favorite one is CodeOcean. We use it extensively in the, in the lab, but there are also Gigant Gigantum, Docker Hub. I'll, I'll show you a little bit what we do with CodeOcean. But uh, for, for us, it was really a game changer to ensure reproducibility in the lab. Um, here's my very personal view of the different levels of reproducibility. Um, it's by no way standards, it's, it's only my opinion, but hopefully that kind of helps categorizing uh, uh, studies a little bit. So obviously if you share everything, uh, you're like level one, best, best level of reproducibility. You share the raw data, the code for quality control and processing, the process data, the code for model training, the final model and the code to, to use it as well as the software environment. I, I put it as a bonus because not, not many people are doing it, but it's gonna, it's gonna become mainstream very soon. So super easy for somebody to, to reproduce. It's very, very trivial. They can actually, instead of, it's not even reproducing anymore. It's, they can already think about the next step. What do they wanna do with it, right? While before, while if you don't share everything, it might actually be very hard to reproduce. So if you don't share the raw data and the QC and pre-processing, you still share a lot of good research outputs for the community to build upon. Um, you basically share the process data, code for training, the, the model and the code for applying the model, as well as the software environments, if you wish. So, um, so that's already extremely valuable. It's a little bit of pity. It's, it's a pity that you didn't share the raw data and the code for QCM processing because people cannot really go back and try a new pre-processing, a new normalization method. Sometimes when you want to do meta-analysis, it's better to really go back and try to apply the same method uni in a unified way across all the data set. You, want, you will prevent uh, 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 other people to do so if you don't share the raw data. So level three, like it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit um, narrow in terms of reproducibility. You basically don't share anything except maybe the final model and if you're lucky, some piece of code to, to apply it. So your study is fundamentally not reproducible, but at least people could test the application of your model in your data sets. But if it doesn't work, they have no way to adapt it or improve it. It's, it's either it works or it does not. So I would say it's not nothing, but you really, you really is trying to, um, to, to uh, stretch on the reproducibility concept here. And obviously, if you don't share anything, um, you're not reproducible, that's for sure. Uh, I would argue in a strong way that you might even have published that study in a scientific journal, but it has very little, little to do with science itself. Uh, one of the fundamental principles of science is that people should be able to reproduce, replicate, scrutinize, build upon, challenge on your work. If you don't share anything, for me, it, it, it's more like a commercial advertisement for closed technology rather than anything else. Not, not really uh, anything to do with science. Um, so there is another aspect is that sometimes um, the models become so complex, they, they require a lot of computational, computational resources to, um, to, to train those models. And, and that becomes a little bit uh, of an issue. If you're Google and you have access to uh, 200 GPUs, you can do things that nobody can 
well, very few people in the world can actually reproduce, right? Um, because you, you will probably never have access to the resources. Sometimes they even have very specific hardware uh, to run their neural networks. And we, we see a, pro, uh, a new, we see those new uh, uh, chips being um, optimized for very specific architectures. And those are still very hard to find. Um, so that's a problem. However, I would argue that what is very difficult to do today will probably become very cheap and easy to do in the future. So the, the, let's say in the case of deep learning, the neural networks we were building five years ago are very, like even the best ones are very trivial to run today. Uh, so I think it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a lie to just say, well, I cannot share because it's just too complicated. You won't be able to, to uh, run it. I think you should always share the code even if the, the computational requirements are high, because it will become accessible in the future. So people five years from now will definitely be able to, um, to run your, your, your model. And there are also a whole line of research now where even so you have this very complex, very powerful model, how can you, there are people trying to simplify those models. And sometimes it's just a matter of building a surrogate model with, with a, a much simpler architecture. Um, or they have very clever ways to updates on how the model is trained so that it doesn't require as much memory and this kind of stuff. So it's, it's really kind of an interesting um, line of research as well. Um, and it's actually done all the time. Like people do their discovery, then companies try to, to basically use that model in very, very small chip that are, do not consume much and are very cheap to produce. And, and so they have to basically simplify, simplify the models that work. So what are the lessons that we've learned in, in the lab trying to really think about reproducibility and, and implementing it uh, in the lab? Um, so something that's very, that's really strong and, and I, found, I find amazing is that knowing that we're going to share every single piece of code or data really kind of uh, is a strong motivation to improve the way the quality of the research we do. And, and it sounds very, you know, very, um, very trivial in the sense that, you know, of course, I always do the best I, I can. I'll give you a very, very short example, a very nice story. We, we were implementing a radiomics models and the student leading the project, you know, built a decent model, but it was nowhere exciting. It was kind of okay, the, the accuracy was okay. So I was a bit worried that it would not be very impactful. So instead of pushing it to a public to, to a journal, we decided to take a step back and say, well, we are going to share the data and, and all the code we've done with all the people within our institution. And we are going to organize a friendly challenge. Everybody within the institution can chime in and try to build a better model. So we got some teams participating. And indeed, uh, they build models that were better than what the student did. But the winner of that challenge was a student himself done. I'm not sure why, but maybe the process of creating the data, the process of putting his code out there, thinking hard about how, how, he, could, how he could do a little bit of friendly competition. And he was basically the winner by a, a large margin. So it actually benefited himself uh, quite a bit. So again, this expectation of sharing and, and being scrutinized by multiple research groups is usually a strong motivation to do, to do your best. Uh, containers really makes it super easy to collaborate because everybody's using exactly the same software environment. It's very easy to, to ship the code to somebody and say, hey, I have this bug, can you help fixing it? At least you're not spending time figuring out that it's a different version of the library that was causing the, the problem. Um, sharing research increases your impact. And at least in my career, really was a strong, um, you're providing me very good opportunities for new collaborations. People knowing that, knowing that you share and you're transparent, people want to access your data, they want to access your code, uh, or sometimes they just want to work with you because you know they know you're open-minded on those things. And I would like to reiterate again that open science and research reproducibility do not prevent commercialization. If, if, if that's what you want to do, it's completely okay. Uh, you just have to think about your, your licenses. 
uh, um, before releasing all the materials, but you can be transparent and, and commercialize uh, your research output if you want. And of course, being reproducible doesn't mean that you're correct. Um, but it means that if there is something wrong in whatever analysis you've done, then it becomes possible for other people to find it and correct it or, or communicate with you and, and, and improve your, your pipeline. If you don't share everything, you might, you might be correct, you might be wrong, nobody will ever find out. So if you're interested, uh, we've published a recent comment uh, about uh, a Google Health study where they were basically level undefined for reproducibility. They didn't share anything. Uh, so that really triggered us to try to get together and, 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 and explain, basically communicate all those platforms that exist uh, to make uh, research reproducible, really to show that this is not a technological problem. It's, it's more like a willingness of the investigators uh, to share rather than a technological challenge. Um, so I think I still have, uh, okay, I still have time. So I would like to show you two platforms that we've, uh, we've used and, and the second one that, that we've developed to kind of improve a little bit reproducibility within the lab. And hopefully you're gonna find that useful for your own research. So, um, Codotion, as I said, Codotion is this uh, platform that helps you build Docker containers and share them in the cloud. So basically, his main mission was to uh, allow people to easily define and share the software environment. But what, that, what, what it means is that basically you could also use the platform to share data. It could be part of the Codotion infrastructure or it, it could be part of your Docker container directly. Obviously, you can share the code within your Docker. You can share your models. Again, the, the code is running, it trains the model, so it can it, it basically keep the final uh, uh, model. And you can use it to share analysis results. Again, all the results are being stored within the Docker container. I'll show you why, why I think Codotion is actually a very easy platform to use for the community. So here is an example of uh, a study we recently published in, in cancer research. So the way it works is that you create your capsule. So um, do you, I, I'm not sure you see my pointer, but on the, on the left side, you have this environment and metadata uh, variables. You see now? Okay, perfect. So here, this is where you're going to define what you need um, to build your Docker. I want that software and that, and that version of the software and so on and so forth. So in that case, it's a, it's a R study. So we basically loaded a few bioconductor libraries, specify the versions just to make sure that uh, in 10 years from now, we can still run the code properly. And then you basically add your code. And here, uh, the first author decided to have a, a few scripts, including different files for different figures. Um, it's your choice. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Every file that's being generated by the code is being put in that results uh, section here. And you can also create um, a directory data where you put your gene set definition or uh, your gene expression data. And basically, um, you start writing, you upload the code like this. You can even edit the code on the platform if you wish so, or you can just synchronize it with a GitHub. And basically, you just click on the reproducible run uh, button here. And what it's going to do is basically run the code and generate all the files. And here you can see it's a very, very short analysis. So it took only one, one minute and 16 seconds. It generated all those files. So those are all the figures from the paper. And once it runs, you basically say it's version one, and then you can publish it. And here we, we, we actually publish that capsule, and then you get the DOI. And Nobody can alter that capsule. This is now on the platform. It has a digital object identifier. You cannot manipulate it in any way. What other people can do now is to go on Codotion, look for this capsule, clone it so that they have a capsule they can edit and they can start doing whatever they want with it. Like if they don't like the clustering we used or the, if they want to use, I don't know, Euclidean distance instead of your you know, one minus Pearson correlation in the clustering, they can just modify that, click on one, get all the new results. So the beauty now is that the question is not so much, is it reproducible? Yes, it is, because the platform actually certified that the code run and generate those results. The question becomes, 
what about this? What about this? If I change these parameters, what happens? So you can directly skip that step, skip that step of reproducing and directly focus on you know, scrutinizing and challenging the result. So we now use that platform for every single publication we uh, um, push, uh, um, that we, we, every studies that we do in the lab. There are only very, very few cases where we were not able to associate a collision capsule with a publication because the data were sensitive. And uh, I'm now talking to the company to try to see how we can handle that issue because obviously you cannot put the data in the capsule it would make them publicly available. So there might be a mechanism here where you, you would request access to a capsule through a data access committee, for instance. But those, those cases are relatively rare. It depends a little bit on your field, obviously. Um, so how, do, how did we use that platform really in the lab? So I, I told you every, every publication needs to have a collation capsule associated to it from now on. But we had studies in the past that we were interested to make easy to reproduce. And, there are, and, and it also depends when you start thinking about reproducibility. So if you do it over the course of the analysis, that's probably the best way. So be, you basically start thinking directly, I want to make that um, study reproducible. So I'm going to work directly on code ocean. And that's a possibility. Code ocean provides workstations. You can put your code and, and run everything. And you can run it 10,000 times until you get the results you want. Be careful of the uh, implicit uh, overfitting here, but that's something you can do. Um, and it's also a good tool for collaborations because multiple people can access the same capsule and modify the code and run it. Um, sometimes we use it at the very end. So the, 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 the postdoc or the student worked on a given study, everything works. And then I will ask them, you need to one, we run everything from scratch in a code ocean capsule. Second, I want somebody else to look at the code, make sure that you know, the results are what we think they are. And before code ocean, it would be super hard really for uh, to reproduce exactly the same results. Like 90% of the time, we would get slightly different results. Thankfully, it's usually you know, always so close that it doesn't really change the claim. But I had a few, a few publications where we thought we found something great, reproduce everything from scratch, for whatever reason, maybe software, different software libraries or temporary files that have been saved to, to, to you know, save time and then you know, forgot to update when you change the code and all the results were falling apart. I had a couple of publications like this where we could not submit um, because we were not able to reproduce ourselves, our results. So that's the problem when you wait too long, you, you may actually uh, face some, some big issues if the results are not exactly um, the same than before. Um, so I, I always have this internal review prior to my uh, manuscript submission. And then when I submit, I try to show the reviewers that everything we do is reproducible. So I give them access to the capsule. So hopefully that give them trust that even if they don't like the science, uh, and even so it's not a, 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 a a proof that there is no error in the code, at least I'm being open about it and they can, they can dig into the code in a very easy way. And hopefully for the editors, it's also a good indication that uh, this study might have some impact because people can easily reuse what we've done. And sometimes we do it after the fact. So for all publications, we went back, tried to reproduce everything for, for various reasons. Uh, either we wanted to improve what we've done in the past, or people came back to us with some criticisms that we had to you know, dig into. Um, and, and that's actually, I'll, I'll present a shortly a study that we've made that we've published in 2013, where we actually use that, that, um, that process. And sometimes you just want to update your results because new data got released and you just want to rerun everything again, make sure that your published results still hold with the new data. Um, so if you use it for continuous development, uh, great. You start uh, using the code ocean uh, capsule right away. You control your software environment. You can optimize collaborations. You can run the code many times. If it uses a lot of large computational resources, there is a beta functionalities where you can use your own hardware to run the code. So instead of running it in the cloud and basically 
um, use, uh, um, in that case, Amazon resources, you can actually say, uh, use the collection platform, but it will basically consider your computer as part of the cloud and, and get it to run uh, your software. So you can use your own infrastructure if you wish to run the analysis. So that's the best way to do it. But not everybody likes to work in, in, in using the code ocean interface on the web. If you have to work offline, if you're on a plane, whatever, it's not super convenient. So I'm not saying this is the only approach, but it's definitely one of the best. So if you do it um, just before the publication, so you're done with the analysis, you clean your code, now it's time to build the code ocean capsule. But Again, you want to have in the independent review, it's standard practice in the lab now. So you, I asked another member to go through it, rerun everything. And again, surprising how often the results change. Um, not too dramatically uh, most of the time, but sometimes it could be really bad. When you do it after the publication, after the fact, so it happens to us. So we, we did analysis, we had some unexpected results. So we were, we were expecting some fair, um, our fair share of scrutiny. So people would definitely look into this because, because the result was surprising. So we worked, we worked very hard to share the code and everything, but we didn't really, we didn't have access to code ocean at the time. So it was basically, here's the data, here's the code. You pay, the paper is accepted, you publish it. Now the fun really begins because you're gonna have all those requests from a reader saying, hey, I downloaded the code, downloading the data, it doesn't work. There's a problem here, there's a problem here. And then it really becomes a burden for you to basically try to, to understand what's going on. Is it a problem with their software library? Maybe they, are, they got the wrong version. Is it a problem in your code? Something that you overlooked, something that you forgot to document. And it, it really took us a lot of time. So uh, here, here's the examples, we published that a study comparing different pharmacogenics data sets, one from the Broad and one from the Sanger. And we found surprisingly high level of inconsistency between those two data sets. Something that maybe for pharmacologists it was to be expected, but for bioinformaticians and machine learner in general, definitely something to worry about. A science that could be very resistant in one data set could be very sensitive in the other data set. So it makes it very, very hard to train and, and validate your, your drug response uh, models. So we published a paper, we received so many requests um, and criticism and comments that we basically had to spend, uh, I think we spent three years just digging into those data, digging into our own code uh, to basically um, address all those comments. So it was really, really tough. Uh, so we developed PharmacoGX, a package to really streamline this kind of analysis. And um, we actually published an updated version of our paper. So, so that's something I'm, I'm also pretty kind of upset about the, the current system of publication is that when you publish a paper, it looks like this is a done deal. Like your publication is there and, and, and that's the end of the story. I would argue that post publication the life, the, post the life after the initial publication should be as important as all the work you've done prior to the publication. So in our case, the, the Broad and the Sanger released new data. So we wanted to, to check whether our conclusions were still uh, holding. We had better software, we had better methods. So we decided to redo the analysis, improve the analysis in all the ways possible. Then we contacted Nature and obviously they didn't want to publish that kind of things. We didn't even want to be on PubMed or anything. We just wanted to be, to put a link somewhere in the paper saying, hey, there is an update of that analysis. They refused. So what we had to do is to find a new home for that updated analysis. But you can imagine that publishing negative results is hard, but publishing an update of a published paper is almost impossible on a, in a regular journal. So we decided to go with F1000 research. It's kind of this, um, open science journal where they actually publish your stuff right away and they do post publication review. So we had like three reviewers um, and it, it's nothing is anonymous. It's kind of a, a, an interesting platform. So we had uh, many comments, including great ones from Michael Hallett, who basically, I think wrote us a review longer than the paper itself. Um, and it really improved our study uh, uh, significantly. So we, we published it there. 
So that's kind of a, the, good, the good outcome. And that was our first uh, corrosion capsule, by the way. And, and why it, was it so important for us to share everything we could? As I said, we got so many comments. You can see here on the timeline, those are all the papers that kind of followed our initial uh, inconsistency, uh, our initial publication. Some are from our group where we tried to fix the errors or improve the analysis. And a lot of comments are from other groups. So it was a huge amount of work. If we, if we, didn't, if we had not shared the code and the data, it would have been impossible for us to really follow uh, on all those comments. Uh, so at least there, sometimes the people would just make big claims and say, look at line 232 of that file on GitHub and you can clearly see that your claim is wrong. We didn't do that. So it was kind of a very interesting to be, to, to have everything online to make sure that we were protected against uh, uh, false uh, criticism in a way. So in the lab, we've used it so far on 16 publications since 2017. And, and we use it for all the publications. So if you just have eight canes on Colossian, you can, you can find all the capsules that we've published. We, we had some, we, there are some papers that we were not able to, to get Colossian capsule with um, because of private data. One, because we used a proprietary software from IBM uh, to optimize a, a, a logic model. And we cannot put it on Colossian because of the restriction of that license. And sometimes it, it really requires very, very expensive computational resources. Like if you want to retrain a whole TCGA, Kodoshin is not the great platform for this. Uh, you're gonna receive a pretty steep bill. Uh, for all the other capsule, we didn't pay anything. It's just part of the uh, uh, free user quota uh, is, is far sufficient for most studies. Um, so back, so what am I doing? Okay, um, so I'll go very quickly because you, you definitely Excel is bad, Excel is evil. Try not to use it for uh, any data transformation. You, you cannot really track back uh, what has been done. You know, uh, R and, and Python and all those programming languages are, are much, much better, obviously, to do your study. And you can definitely implement uh, a test run with a published study to see whether you can reproduce the result, this kind of stuff. And, and really, it requires expertise in the lab. This is some research reproducibility as a cost. This is not, it doesn't come for free. You need to spend time, resources, you need the expertise to do it right. So I really hope that funding agencies will start to realize that and, and allocate budget for this uh, data coordination and, and make sure everything is reproducible. So I'll go very quickly so we have a bit of time for questions. Um, one aspect that people don't really focus on is this quality control and pre-processing of the data. We usually do it once. We don't really care much about being reproducible for that step. Once we have the process data, then we start paying attention. And I think that's, that's a mistake. Um, we are dealing with a lot of data that keeps changing. They have new versions, new updates every, every month, every six months, every year. So we really have to keep track of how we process the data and what version of the data we are dealing with. And so we built this platform called Orchestra. And it basically, it's, it's something, it's a platform in the cloud that orchestrates the pre-processing of all our data sets in the lab. So we have pharmacogenomics, toxicogenomics, um, PDX pharmacogenomics data, clinical genomics data, and radiogenomics data. And we are, are working on a, on, a, on a variant for radiomics as well. And so what it does, it, it basically, as a user, you go online, you go on orchestra and say, oh, I want this data set. I want this version of this data, this version of this data, this version of this data, and I want the data to be pro processed by pipeline X, Y, Z. You click on submit, and if the object already exists because another user requested it or because that's something we use in the lab, then you get it right away. Uh, and you get a digital object identifier associated with it, and you get a web page that describes exactly the data you have. So you always have kind of document online documentation of the data that you're using. If the data did not exist, like your request is unique um, and it has not been created before, it sends a request to our uh, Kubernetes Pachyderm um, engine uh, on Microsoft Azure. It will process the data, create that data object for you, upload it on Zenodo, get the DOI, and get, the, and get a page uh, for that new data set. And what we try to do here is not only to, we, we try to be fair. Uh, so it's easy to find the data, it's easy to access it. 
it's interoperable in the sense that we try to standardize every annotations and use proper ontologies. So it should be, if you take two data from orchestra, they should use the same ontology. So it's easy to do meta-analysis, this, this kind of stuff. And it's reusable because you can easily share that data with somebody else. You basically just give them the URL or the DOI and they can download the exact same data set that you're using. And we really build it for, to maximize cross data set operability and, and proper versioning uh, of, of our data. Um, so here's the interface. So we have what we call canonical uh, data sets, where basically those are the data sets we use in the lab. So for instance, we like to use Callisto for RNA, uh, and we use this version of the drug sensitivity data, which is the latest version for that data set, and so on and so forth. So here you have a data set where we have other versions with uh, other, other uh, way to process the data or other reference genomes. But this is the one uh, we prefer to use because it's the most updated one, for instance. So if you don't care, you just go there, download the data you want. But if you actually care, you can actually go here and say, well, I want this data set, I want this data, this and this and this data. Um, and then you click on, if it does not exist, you will have nothing on the table. You click on request and it will send you an email when the data are ready for you. So yeah, so um, that's it for the talk. I hope I, I convinced you that research reproducibility not only is important conceptually, but we have a lot of tools to actually make it happen, implement it in practice for everything you do in the lab, at least from a computational perspective. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation, Benjamin. There's a quick cause, uh, question in the chat asking whether the slides might be available. I know that you're being recorded, but... Uh, and, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, actually, it's a Google slide. I'll send the URL to Celia and the organizers, and I'll also put it on my lab website, so you can always take a look back at the slides if you wish. Great. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question from Guillaume. Um, is there a cost? Cost. For Nothing me. is free in life, Guillaume, um, but... They use very, very cheap instances of Amazon's uh, resources. So if you just go with the free account, um, you can do, I mean, all the publications I have showed, like the 16 capsules we have, we always, we were always within this free coda. So we never had to pay anything. And the reason is that I usually start from the process data. So even if you have, I don't know, rna sick for 10,000 patients, once you transform that into, let's say, a CSV or a summarized experiment, it's usually a few dozens of gigabytes. And that's the kind of data and, and, and computation that Codution can easily handle. If you want to train a deep learning with very fancy GPU for like a month, don't use Codution. I would say you're still going to have to rely on your internal resources because it may cost quite a bit to secure those resources in Codution. Um, but obviously, Codotion is working with big companies, companies who are willing to pay the Amazon bill uh, and access to the platform. But Codotion doesn't make money out of the resources. They just make money out of the interface. And for academics, um, the free account is actually uh, covering most of our needs. I see that Stephanie has turned on her camera. Stephanie, do you have a question? I, I did. Hi, thanks, Benjamin. Um, I was. You mentioned running into trouble with the um, at the time of publication, and we've seen how journal policies on data availability really helped with data sharing in genomics. You know, for example, where how yeah you know, how far ahead are the journals on this in the machine learning you know, typical venues and so on? Yeah, that that's that's a very good question. So. Um, full disclosure, I'm a, uh, an editor at uh, ACR Cancer Research, and I know the ACR journals have, have um, extract, struck uh, a partnership with Codotion um, so that if you submit your paper there and you have a Codotion capsule, at least it will be advertised in during the submission process. So as an editor, I see whether there is a Codotion capsule associated to it. And if you put it in your cover letter, then the, the reviewers can access the, the Codotion uh, capsule. And I think that goes a long way. As an editor, I can tell you, um, I'm super excited when I see this because I know that the reviewers will, will have access to all the information. 
And even if the science is wrong, at least we can fix it later <laughs> because we have access to everything. So as an editor, I'm more likely to send a paper out, especially when it's purely computational, if, if I see that level of transparency, but it's not enforced in any way. Um, so I'm working a little bit with, uh, with the editor-in-chief to see, you know, how can we get uh, authors to embrace that kind of technology a, a, bit, a bit more? Because I think for the moment, it's only like one or 2% of the submissions using this. Uh, so it's definitely nowhere to be widely adopted. Um, I know Kodoshin is also working with uh, Springer Publishing Group, so Nature and the like. So it's definitely on the map. The problem is, it's like this checklist uh, that you fill when you, when you publish a paper in those high impact journals. It's usually an afterthought. Like you do all your analysis and say in your checkboxes, yeah, I, I, you know, I specified the sample size, I specified the standard error, I did one sided t test, whatever. I mean, to be honest, it's not really, it's not really changing practice. People just check boxes. I would not say randomly, but they don't really pay much attention. How do we get authors to think about this earlier so that when they submit their paper is better, like it's more well producible? It's still a big, big challenge. I, I, I wish funding agencies and journals would put a bit more emphasis onto this, but they're also afraid of losing, you know, clients and projects and stuff. So there's a bit of tension there, but I think the mentality is changing. We're, we're getting better at reproducibility, but it was a long way to go. Can I follow up on that comment? Uh, you know, if, if many institutions offer a variety of services to all of their researchers, whether it be glass washing or accounting. Um, is this something that should be offered as a kind of a service at an institutional level? Because a big lab can afford to do it and a small lab probably cannot. Or, or you don't have the expertise and it takes yes. Yes. time and money to build that expertise. It's very interesting that you say that. So Princess Margaret is trying to build now a bioinformatics super group, realizing that a lot of, um, I'm sure we all have like bioinformatics score and the like, right? But the problem with the core is that they have to be very cost effective. So they tend to have very specific pipelines. And if you go outside those pipelines, it becomes an issue. So what Princess Margaret is trying to do now, and it's something that, um, um, yeah, we're still you know, talking about this, but we try to build a group that can really interact with scientists who have no bioinformaticians in their, in their lab because either they're too small or it's not their area of research or biostatistician and say, well, you can talk to those folks, they're expert, they're gonna work with you. What I'm trying to do is for that group to adopt Codotion or any other platforms, by the way, to make research much more reproducible, but one click away to make your publication more producible, which means that you would go to that group, say, hey, I'm interested in doing this kind of analysis. They would work with you, but they would work in a way that they build this Docker container. So when you publish your paper, you automatically have a Docker container attached to your paper. Even if you're not computationally savvy and you know nothing about Docker, it's still there, right? And if that works, that means that maybe for 50% of the publication, um, the, because people are going to use that group, fifty percent of the publication could be reproducible by construction, even so they know nothing about how this is done. And I think this is this would be fantastic. So I'm trying to, within the institution, we're trying to build a resource that basically by construction makes everything reproducible. So people don't have to think or, or be afraid of it, don't think too hard about it, and they don't have to build their internal um, expertise. So it's yeah, something we really I'm looking forward to implement, but it's going to be challenging for sure. There's a long question in the chat from Sahir. I don't know if you want to turn on your microphone, Sahir. Okay. Hi. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, uh, thanks for the talk. I was just, uh, it was just a comment to the challenges that you mentioned. I wrote it in the chat. But basically, um, I said inertia in the academic promotion system is another challenge, I would say, because as you've mentioned, it takes a ton of time and resources to really make your study reproducible. And it feels like the benefit to pre-tenure researchers is limited. So I don't know if you had any comments on that, but, but uh, from my point of view, someone who's junior, um, it seems like trying to publish more papers versus trying to make them re reproducible. While I see the benefit to science in general, 
it's, it's, it's hard to make that, uh, make that choice. I, don't know. I mean, you just started to talk, I could talk two days about this. It's like, it's very, very complex. So I would say two things to make it brief. One, you need to work with your leadership or promotion committee to, to make them understand a few things. First, being transparent really matters. So when you share data, when you share code, that should be counted as proper scientific contributions. Sometimes a software gets more used or more cited than, than, than this fancy new biological paper in nature. So I think this is really something we need to hammer down at the promotion committee. Uh, when your data are being used by another group, for me, it's a huge success. That's how science should be done, right? But it's not properly quantified. It's not really taken into account during your promotion. The second aspect is, it's an investment you, 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 you're making um, for yourself. It's not, reproducibility is first for, your, for you and then for the community. Uh, when you submit a paper and it comes, the revision comes you know, six months late as usual and the student left to work for that fancy company and making twice your salary, then you're in trouble, right? If you don't make, if, if your research is not reproducible, it's gonna be a hurdle, a nightmare to go back to the data, understand what the student did and reproduce the whole thing. So it's a very short-term investment. Long-term investment, I presented that story about this inconsistency paper. Without reproducibility, we would, we would have been dead. You can imagine that the broad and the singer were pretty pissed off about what I've, you know, the publication I've done. The only way I survived is because I shared everything and I could really kind of reproduce and redo more analysis super quickly. So, I agree with you, it's very tempting to do two publications instead of one that's reproducible. But long run, it, I think it's a bad calculation. Uh, but look, I've been an early investigator. I know how tough it is. Unless the leadership tells you, make your thing reproducible, we are going to value it. It's going to be very hard for you to just ship your resources into research reproducibility rather than having more studies um, being accomplished. So it's really, it's a whole system that we need to change. I'm looking at the time here. Um, there's a, Guillaume, you had your microphone on for a little bit. Did you have a question? Well, I just wanted to build on that. I think, I mean, and also I thought the conversation, but you asked the same question, Celia, about what the institutions can do. I think it's, you know, it's number one, it's recognizing it. And, and number two is help and maybe provide some resources to facilitate that. And I was just gonna say that, you know, I think this is also true in the context of the new organization for digital research. Uh, you know, the fact that, that software will be valued and I think reproducible science will be valued. I think there will be opportunities to, to really start providing resources to support this, this type of effort. but. But thanks a lot, Benjamin. It was a great talk. Uh, I mean, I didn't know about Code Ocean. It looks like a great resource, but overall, it was very interesting. I have no stock options. I just love the platform. But yeah, there, very nice. There are, there are many alternatives. I just found that one very easy to use because there is also this barrier. Like, even if I have to convince my own postdoc to do it, I can't do it because I have a big stick, right? But they usually say yes, and then they don't do it. And I want to chase them down. So, Code Ocean just makes it super easy that they have literally no excuse for not doing it. And, I and I, I have, there's yep. a comment about MATLAB. Um, yep. Yeah, I don't use MATLAB. And, and one of the reason is that it's just, it's when it's not open source, everything is more complicated. So I, I understand that in certain communities, MATLAB is the number one uh, software, but it's, it's, it's a tough nut to crack. Uh, if you really want to be open and transparent, you, the, the MATLAB community is always going to be much more limited than R and Bioconductor or Python, just because of this closed aspect of, of the programming language. Uh, it's, uh, Guillaume, you've put a little comment. Uh, somebody has a question? Antoine? No? OK. Uh, yes, it's a compliment to, do you hear me? Yes. It's a compliment to Professor Badnagar point, which is, I feel like it's, I mean, I feel like the juniors, as he said, has enough pressure on them right now. And 
asking them to follow those policies on top of that is a little bit weird to me. It's targeted audience for this speech. And the people convinced should be the tenure committees and the journals. And if you manage to convince them and they embrace those policies, everything will follow, including the juniors that will probably gladly follow, I believe. So shouldn't all those people, the people, the people in power with big quotes, uh, be the target audience and the people to convince first? So yeah, there is a tension between like the bottom up and the top down approach, right? Kinda. We're, we're relatively small fishes, right? So I mean, unless there is a dean of a university or director of of, of an institution on the line. Um, we try to do our best at the bottom and, and I'm not junior anymore and my lab is, is you know, well uh, supported. So I can afford to make those points. So I use every occasions I have to, to make those points to, to make them a bit, a bit more visible. But there, there should be something from the top as well. As you said, like if, if this is a philosophy, if it's a policy for a given institution, then junior will follow because they know it's, it's part of, of being in that institution. But unless you have this signal from the top, the only thing you can do is to try to, 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 get, it, to get it more and more and more visible until, until they cannot ignore it anymore. Uh, actually, the DORA principle to assess research impact is kind of doing this as well, trying to go beyond just impact factor and citations. So I think the discussion is there, but people usually consider them as conceptual. Like it's great to be reproducible, but you know what? In reality, it's too difficult. Don't do it. I, I, tr I hope that I convince you that all the technologies are here. Like if you really want to embrace those, you can streamline the process so it doesn't suck up too, too much of your resources if you, if you do it in a certain way. So I, I hope that, that I convince you of that, but the, the leaders needs to be convinced as well. I think we should perhaps wrap it up here for today. It's been a, a really thought provoking uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And challenging us all to up our game. Um, so uh, on behalf of MICM and on behalf of, uh, of QLS, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation today. You're welcome. If you find one of my publications that's not reproducible, no, I'm obliged to make it reproducible. So don't need <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Benjamin. <laughs>